Hey, everybody. This is Wake Up Call Live. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Christina Previtt, and joining me is my esteemed panel. And I think you have all been on at some point in time. So you are officially VIPs. Thank you very much. So um, in case they need introduction, we have Linda Hinkle. She's a divorce lawyer in New Jersey. Jennifer Hillegas is also a therapist in New Jersey, and Sylvia Bridewich is also a divorce lawyer in New Jersey. Thank you so much for joining us today, you guys. I really appreciate it. And we are going to talk about the Hulu limited series, A Teacher, which is about a teacher who has an inappropriate affair with her student. And I watched this. I sort of like was just scrolling through and I'm like, oh, let me see what this is about and was captivated. I thought it was really well done. Definitely sort of a taboo subject. And I kind of want to get your initial impressions, like thumbs up, thumbs down on the, the way it was presented. Yeah. Totally thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Good. Thumbs up. And I have to say that this was like initially when you start watching it, and I want to see what you guys think about this. I thought they did a really good job of drawing you in to strictly this relationship that existed between the teacher and the student in such a way that it seemed very romantic and you almost felt for them. Like you almost felt like, oh, but they're in love. I mean, that was me anyway. Maybe I'm not, re hopefully I'm not revealing myself to be some kind of weirdo now, but <laughs> initially that's how I felt. And then at some point, like you kind of go through the feelings. I think that they showed the, the victim go through on the show is it, you sort of start to feel like, but wait a minute, you know, she, she's his teacher. He's a kid. What did you guys, what were you feeling as you were watching it? I think it was very similar. I mean, you start to, you get, and that, that feeling that you said that you, you hope you're not seeming like you're gross. I feel like I felt like that too. And that was the point. Yeah. I think that was the point is that you could see how someone from the other side, not that anyone would ever do that, but how you can get caught up in this love story and forget that there were major consequences and really big issues behind that. And then the abusive nature. Sometimes I had to, I remembered like, oh, they were talking about like grooming. Like there was a warning at the beginning of yeah. the show. Like, I forgot this is bad. These aren't just two people that I'm reading a book about. Like this is a teacher and a student. This is an adult and a child. There's that, that power yeah. control dynamic you forget about until it kind of loops back around. Yeah, that's a good point. And that starts early, too. We don't even realize it until you look back. But And I remember, like, the first time, I think they were in a restaurant or something, and she made a comment about how you're smarter than your friends. or you're, There was something about the comparison, and it made him here and them here. So, and when you, and when you think about that, like, in a classroom or something, and they was like, oh, best grade, best grade here, you know, and you set that person apart, it means so much more coming from a teacher or any adult in power than it, th that comment right there was the beginning. Yeah, that's wow. a good point. And I think, you know, for me, I didn't, I didn't, I had to kind of look back and kind of think about the grooming because it wasn't quite as obvious to me. It was, I don't think it was meant to be because I don't think anybody realizes it. And I think I read something that there were all these little vignettes that were given to college students and they couldn't pick out the grooming. Mm -hmm. They could not pick out the little situations. And even what I just said, like that one, I kind of noticed because you know what? The, the actress is so good, but you can just tell how flirtatious she is sometimes and she almost turned into a little girl. She's not, she doesn't look as old as she is first. And also to be fair, he doesn't look as young as he was supposed to. That's right. But, but so I think that makes it a little bit easier to almost start to like glorify this. And she had this flirtatious way and it started in the very beginning. I, but you know what? I did see it a little bit differently because for me, I never really caught the romance of it because he starts the interaction. You know, I mean, he's flirting. He's, you know, but she's like, oh, this is interesting. You know, she shouldn't have. She should have just put the stock to it, obviously. But she's she's intrigued. And then she gets involved in the sort of the grooming aspect. But if you remember when everything went down between them, he goes home and says, yes, I'm the man. 
And for me, that was a big red flag that not that he deserved it at all or that this should have happened because he's still young, but that there's really some complicated power dynamics here and that they're exploring it in a different way than the typical, you know, victim, victimizer look. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with that totally. And um, Jennifer, I have to just comment on something you mentioned is that I had a little bit of a hard time kind of placing like the impropriety of the relationship because the, the student, he, I mean, I don't know how old the actor is in real life, but he didn't look like a kid. He's like 25, 26 when this happened. Yeah. So it was like fun. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was tough to yeah. see. And the, honestly, the, probably the only reason they didn't use 17 is because of the working laws. Like, that's probably the only right. reason. So because even the kid, Eric, um, the student in the, the show, at the end, he says something like, you know, I just saw my, my siblings and they were my age huge. and they look like babies. You know, like he's, mm -hmm. and he's looking back on it now as an adult, realizing yeah. like truly how inappropriate it was. Yeah. And if I recall, he said in the mirror twice on the man the first time, twice. but the second time wasn't the same. The second time you could hear emotion behind it. And I felt like that was more like a, he was convincing himself because I think at some point he realized that they were not on the same page with this. This was totally, like she said, an escape for her. And she needed an escape at the time. And it was mostly sexual, if not totally sexual for her. And he was in love with her. Yeah. And that's where it was almost like he was convincing himself the second time, where the first time was absolutely, I read it the same way in that, yeah, you know, like this, you know, hype himself up. He's going to like punch his chest or something. But even then I could see that as really kind of cool for him. And also I was just like, oh, at the same time. Yeah. Which, was brilliant, they, which is brilliant, because if they did it that way, it's brilliant. Yeah, they did a real, they really did. I feel like all of it was, they did it perfectly. I don't know what they could have improved. Maybe you guys have some observations there. But I thought it was well done in terms of the point at which you start to see Eric start to, his opinions start to change. Like, because initially he's like, oh my God, I'm devastated. I'm in love with her. She's going to jail. Like, you know, it's like a breakup, right? Like his first love mm -hmm. puppy love breakup with his teacher. And at some point, you know, you start to see him realizing that, you know what, this wasn't like a love relationship. She, I was a victim. She took advantage of me. What did you guys think about that? I think it was really interesting that it would have probably changed the whole thing for me, except for the fact that he was a senior and 18. So imagine if he had been two years younger in a younger grade, I think the whole experience of the series would have been different for me. Um, and, and I think that he, you know, he's, he's an adult legally almost, you know, I mean, he's, yeah. he's technically an adult. He can vote, he can, you know, all these things, but at the same time, mentally he's obviously not and you know even as he's getting older and you see him in college he's obviously still very young and and processing and going through it and it was so it was so well done that um we see his development in that way and watch him sort of change his perspective and i think that that actually is probably how it really happens you know, I think, you know, I think about some of the famous cases on the news and, and it's probably exactly what happened to these kids. They thought they were in something good. And as time goes on and they look back, it's when they start to realize that that they were they were not in something good. Well, yeah, go ahead, Sylvia. You I, was just, I totally agree with that. And I I just so I watched it twice. You know, we off screen, we talked about that. I watched it twice because I had watched it so long ago and watching it the second time. I didn't buy her level of remorse. I don't think she was really at all upset about what she did, but upset about the ramifications because I still think she felt justified, you know, in in the fact that he was 18 and he wasn't, you know, quote unquote, a legal adult. And, and it was interesting to me because you can see him, you can see the shift, you can see the, the mental shift that he makes, but I never saw it with her. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like, mm -hmm. I had my consequences. I dealt with it. And like, I think she wanted to portray herself as this like hero who like, I turned myself in, but like, 
you did something really awful. And yes, you paid the consequences for it. And, you know, you did what you needed to do. But she never really acknowledged that he was a victim. Well, the only reason she even turned herself in is because the other teacher was. Because she got caught. <laughs> yeah, she got caught. And I remember when she told her, she told her like she was a little schoolgirl in love. I'll never forget that scene because yeah. it was so well acted. And she was like, oh, I'm not sure if I should. And of course, the teacher wants to know more and more because you're making it like it's this juicy detail. And this woman is not thinking that. And there were so many situations of people seeing it differently, like the sister-in-law. And all these times they're seeing it differently. And she's still just baffled. By that like no we're in love wait it's not the same but that's kind of like a cognitive dissonance when your behavior or your situation doesn't match your thoughts we don't change the situation we change the way we think about it we rationalize it and so that's a more and that's exactly what he was doing as well like they did this this whole time and they were almost creating this false i guess reality for themselves because she genuinely i don't think she genuinely thought i think she rationalized it in but she was so hooked on the escape that there was no way she was getting that up so she had to change the way she thought about it in order to stay in it. Yeah. And I love that Eric at the end realizes as an adult. That's a lot of therapy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he realizes that, you know what? This was just an escape for you. It was just a blip on your screen. But it was my whole life. It affected my whole life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it affected yeah. me. It will affect me forever. In, in his own mm -hmm. development. And he recognizes that. And she's still, you know, even though she's saying the words, saying, I'm sorry, she's really not sorry. Like really what she means is, well, I want you to be okay with this so I can feel better about myself. And I mm -hmm. love that he calls her out on that and yeah. says, yeah, mm -hmm. I, you're still talking about you. Right. Oh yeah. Right. Oh yeah. I also think that she didn't have a lot of experience. If you listen to them, they got together very, very young. She almost didn't go through that college, high school kind of situation. And she was sort of living that now at too old of an age. I and mean, she even went to the college with him, which I thought was just really interesting. And nobody thought that that was a little bit weird that she's pretending like she's part. That was the one for me. I was like, what are we doing here? But then you, I know you mentioned earlier, like some famous cases. And I'm so glad that this continued because one of the most famous cases is Mary Kay Letourneau. They got married and had two babies and he was in sixth grade, people. That is crazy. He was in sixth grade. She got out of jail and married him and she just recently died of breast cancer and he was right next to her. That is yeah. not how this goes. And I am just so upset that that was an example, but I've seen an interview with the two of them when they were adults and married and she dominated him the entire time. He barely was able to speak and it was this power thing. And that's really why these, you know, obviously you guys know more about laws, but these laws exist everywhere, not just in schools. It's even in the army and armed forces. It's even in a lot of different HR. You cannot have a relationship with somebody who has power over you that changes the dynamic completely. Yeah. And the, the, the power imbalance was there just because of their age difference, because the she teacher. was a teacher because yeah she had authority over him mm -hmm. and you know let's face it he was a child so his maturity level just wasn't mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. um, so it really was disturbing on so many levels but again as I initially started watching it and I'm sort of just almost thinking like well I don't know what's the big deal like he's almost 18 like if he was 18 and they're in love and he looks so much older and, you know, I kind of felt myself falling into that. Like I felt very schizophrenic as I was watching it. Cause one minute I'd be like thinking, well, I mean, he's going to be 18 or at some point during the show, he turns 18, but then thinking like, but ew, like there's something gross about this, you know, she's there. a teacher. And I can't help but wonder how I would have felt differently and, and, in general, how society feels differently if the teacher had been a man and the student was a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, I think sometimes it, it's easier to feel as though there's a greater power imbalance when the teacher is a male and see the impropriety of that much more. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I think I, so. I, yeah, absolutely. And I will also say that that, that the way that people perceived him as a result of what happened, like he's a hero instead of a victim. 
clearly further victimized him. And I loved that they showed that because I think so often mm-hmm. we brush that under the rug and just figure they're fine because it's a guy and he's okay and his friends are joking about it and it's fine. and he was not fine with that. And I'm so glad we saw that. Yeah. And I actually loved how they portrayed his mother too. Like she, you know, she knew her son, moms know their kids, right? They know when something's off, when something's bothering them. And she knew that things were, he wasn't okay. And, you know, welcomed him home with open arms when he realized also that he wasn't okay. And even though, like when we look at that and grooming, they typically go for the kid from a broken home that doesn't have a parent that has gone through some significant trauma, you know, all of that. So if we, I I love how we can look at this and see the grooming, but also see the love story at any moment. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah. that is just so well done. It, it was very well done. And I, have, I want to understand a little bit more about this from a psychological perspective. It, you know, was, was Claire, was she, aware of the grooming that she was doing? I mean, was it calculated or was it almost just like this something dysfunctional in her that was driven to do it? I mean, the answer to the question might be both because I think that she had a goal, I think. And I think she took steps to get that goal. And the one scene that that sticks out right now when you're asking me that is when they're in the house and when they ran away, right? And he was saying how he really liked her and things like that. And he wanted it to be more than sexual. And in that moment, she was not thinking that all she wanted to do was have sex. And then suddenly she goes, but when you go to college, you're going to, you're not going to want me anymore. And that's where I've changed my mind about it because she thought she was going to lose him and lose this escape is what, how I assessed it. And she did and said whatever she needed to do to make sure that didn't happen. And because that was not how she was approaching this escape. This is what I was looking at. When she was in this little escape, it was about the sex. And it was about the not being around her husband and being pressured to have a baby and all of these things that she was escaping from. And the second that got fragile. So maybe in the very beginning, she didn't. I don't know that when she said how special he was that she had every intention of sleeping with him at the time. But she was intrigued to want to work with him, I think. Or at least at least share her meal with him at that moment. Yeah. And then I think it progressed from there. Um, and then I think once she crossed the line, she got hooked because it's forbidden. Don't forget the forbidden fruit makes it so much more. And I felt like desirable. you could see that. Like, like mm-hmm. you said, at the diner, it, it may have just been like, oh, you know, this kid has to work all the time. Like he's here at night. Like mm-hmm. maybe he does need like his friends just took advantage of him, like with him paying the bill. And then I felt like once it once it stepped over the line, she liked the control she had over the situation. Yes, the control, excellent. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly the word. Yeah, um, and then that's when mm-hmm. she talked about like her whole childhood was like a spiral and then she had no control over. I felt like you could watch it almost switch that she's like, wait, I can manipulate this here versus me being the mm-hmm. one that's being manipulated. I think she liked the attention from him too. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I mean, she's got this young, attractive kid who looks like a man, at least, you know, for the movie, he looked like a man who's an athlete. Mm -hmm. And she kind of said that she never really got to do the whole party thing. Exactly. It was popular. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There she is. And she's getting attention from this attractive Mm -hmm. jock in school. And she liked it. She didn't want to turn it off. Because if you think back to when she did, she did the right thing initially and said, no, this can't happen. But then as soon as he started moving on and paying attention to other people in his normal juvenile life, she didn't right. like that. And she reeled him back in. And if you recall, actually, very as soon as she said that, he started to beg her to work with him. Right. And so there that became her saying no, no, no. And then she had all the power. He's begging, please, please, please. OK, fine. And now that she's all the way up here and I think you're absolutely right. She got hooked on that. Like that was somebody begging you for your time and your expertise or whatever it was that she just got intoxicated by. And she was not giving that up. Yeah. I don't think that she ever, uh, and I think one of you recognized this too. I I don't think that she did ever really appreciate the magnitude of what she did. And not just to Eric, but to other people in her life, her Her husband. 
Oh, oh my God. I yes. felt so bad for him. Yeah. I mean, I tried to think to, you know, how I would feel if I was in that situation. You know, you learn that your spouse is having an affair with their student. So you have to deal with that. There, they, there was an affair, right? There was an infidelity. And it was with a minor, with a student. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't even know how you could. I, I think he does say at some point, like, I don't know how I ever loved you. Mm hmm. Um, but I, I thought it was really powerful, the scene where she goes to his house to sign the divorce papers. And he says at some point, oh, mistake. Is that what you're calling it? Mm -hmm. Because it was just her way of minimizing it. Yeah. How long did she get in jail? Because they kept talking about how they threw the book at her. But I didn't feel like it was that long. I don't know what the, and obviously that's not my. Yes. Was it seven? Oh, I don't know. Sure. I don't think so because he was mm -mm. wasn't he in college when she got out? The mother had told him like when she gets home, you're gonna need yeah. to talk. Oh, to maybe somebody. yeah. Okay, yeah. so it was only a few years. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't that three long. or four maybe, maybe two, three, four, something like that. I and, think but when they said throw the book, it was because initially her brother and and he was someone else she took advantage of and oh, his yeah. authority because he had said to her they're probably not going to charge you if you cooperate but then they ran away so then they charged her with the kidnapping right. or whatever right. i didn't really get that though as a lawyer because he was 18 when that happened yeah i struggled with the law part of it too <laughs> because i'm thinking well first off he's 18 yeah there's this abuse of power but uh you know i mean there's some questions here about what the law is but i, I also do we even know what state they're in i don't know what state they're in i, I don't know no. i forget so yeah. Yeah. I think it was like more of an alluding thing like they knew that she knew they were coming to get her and she was like running from the police versus like kidnapping. Maybe that. Well, she had, she been arrested yet at that the, point. They were talking and she, I'm pretty sure it was like understood that she basically is going to have to answer for this. And he said just, and it, and it was him. And that's why he blamed himself all this time because he's like, let's just go, let's run away together. And of course she would want to, if she wanted to escape before, of course she's going to want to escape now. Right. Yeah. Um. I did think that Eric took a little bit of his power back when they did sort of run away together. And he's in the car saying, I kind of feel like you're kidnapping me. Um, if you go to their Instagram page, they have a lot of clips just to kind of refresh your memory mm -hmm. about some of them. Um, and he says that to her. I don't know if he was being serious at all, if it was a joke at the time when he said it to her. But they go off to the hotel. They have their last hurrah together. And then he leaves. He just leaves, mm -hmm. right? And she and I thought that scene was really powerful because it shows her looking for him, sort of a little bit in a panic, you know, like where did he go? He left me, and then going outside, being utterly alone and realizing that he left mm -hmm. and didn't say goodbye. So you know, I think that may have been also where the shift was starting to happen with him. See, I I think the shift happened with him. With her, I think that. I don't feel like that was like, oh, I'm alone. I sort of felt like she was like, like, I don't have that control anymore because she was, she had gotten really, didn't she get really drunk the night before and was like talking yeah, yes. and I think she just figured like, he's always going to do what I want him to do. And I wasn't a part of this decision and that's not how this has happened so far. And then I think she was like, well, now what am I going to do? I have to go turn myself in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The consequence for her was yeah. the like deflation. Yeah. Jennifer, have you ever worked with um, anybody in, in a similar situation, like where there was, an, you know, um... I've had clients tell me about students um, in these situations. And honestly, in, in this, in the one case I'm thinking of, it was a girl and it was like a, a teacher, but a coach kind of thing. And this was an interesting one because Yes, he was her coach at the time that she was in high school, but this was her sophomore year of college. But my client was still disgusted by it. Like, oh, I can't believe he did that. He's old. I think he just got married or he might have had a baby. You know, I don't know what the case was, honestly. But um, and that was an interesting thing to me where I don't know if I had a male client in there telling me about it. See, I think it has a little bit changed because we are teaching kids about this, that it's not OK. It's not cool. Um, but it's an interesting perspective. Again, with the male female thing, there is a huge double standard. 
Did you feel like there was anything sort of missing if, based upon your experience as a mental health professional? Did you feel like there was any aspect of this that maybe was missing or that they could have done a little better? I mean, they didn't show him going to therapy, but the way he spoke at the end, 100% meant he went to some therapy, I would say. Um, but other than that, I think that it was, I just was so appreciative of the last few episodes because we don't get the story after there's nothing that tells us the story after and the consequences, the alcoholism and the escaping absolutely kind of like a almost trauma response to the stripper who was basically older, um, around, I don't know, she might've even been older, but around that age. And he had a reaction to that. I mean, let's think about, I mean, if you really wanted to push it, is that any different than a firework and the soldier hitting the deck? He had that really strong reaction. That would tell me that's a trauma reaction. But was that because of the relationship or because of the end of the relationship? I don't know either way he was traumatized. I don't think it matters. Yeah. So maybe you could shed a little light on that aspect because he, even though we all recognize as adults that this was highly inappropriate, I mean, that's even six, putting it mildly. At the time, he didn't. You know, he was, you know, he was the man. He was having sex with an older woman and, right. you know, he was having a good old time. He, you know, wasn't recognizing this, this terrible power imbalance, but at some point he starts to see that. But how would that affect somebody in their development? Well, I think that even before that, he had an intense amount of guilt because he thinks that he put the person that he loved into jail. He thinks it was his fault. He said it a bunch of times. If I just hadn't told the truth, if I just hadn't had you go with me when really, you know, the power imbalance, he really didn't have a decision. It was going to go her way anyway. And so I think that tremendous amount of guilt and then the sheer, like we've all had the high school relationship breakup. Let's like not forget that that is traumatizing. I mean, I remember singing Alanis Morissette like over and over again, just, <laughs> you know, hysterical. So that's and if you think about that that alone right the end of the relationship the heartbreak the blaming himself for it. like imagine if you put someone you loved in danger or in jail like oh my gosh right. i can't imagine that i think that's really where it started but he's not seeing it i think that was traumatizing and beating himself up it sounds like he had intrusive thoughts that just played over and over again i can't believe like beating yourself that negative self-talk was happening he got rid of that with alcohol which that's what he was doing i think but that rendered him it, unable to focus go to class like it just kind of became a depressive state but the whole time he was thinking about her and if he didn't want to think about her he had to drink or something along those lines and then that there and it like, continued that cycle so i think that the real development issues is that he was really just not present yeah. for a lot of those i mean your brain's not even fully developed till 25 plus now is the research so during that time he's got an addiction he's not present and he's plagued by, I would say, intrusive, what we would call intrusive thoughts. And after you say that, I think of the, the scene at, towards the end in the grocery store when they see each other mm -hmm. and how just nonchalant she is about like, oh my God, Eric, hi, how hi. are you? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, now that you yeah. say that and like that he, it was such a consistent, like was so likely a consistent thing going on in his head. And she's just so nonchalant, like, oh, hi, this is my daughter. Like, how are mm -hmm. you? What are you doing home? I'm going grocery shopping. Like, like it was no big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was a good way of demonstrating how little it really affected her life mm -hmm. compared to him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it. I mean, his life is affected forever. They her tried to show how it affected her life, you know, with the woman making sure she didn't get the job and then like the guy, you know, looking her up. But even that wasn't, you know, the important years of development and, you know, how he suffered. That's not the same. The one thing I did find myself empathizing with her a little bit, sympathizing maybe is more appropriate, mm -hmm. um, was in the event that like someone can theoretically get rehabilitated from like this kind of behavior, the fact that like she did move on, theoretically she's changing her life. She has these two kids and she can't be involved with things with their activities. Like, like how she was saying, she can't be on the PTA. She can't do that kind of stuff. I never thought about that like to that extent, like what mm -hmm. happens then when you have your own children, it, that, that was the one part that I was like, wow, like that has to be tough. Like, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You can't take your kids to practice. You can't take your kids to certain places. Like you can't go to school. You can't do those things. And I did 
for like a hot minute <laughs> for like a hot minute i felt bad for her and then i was like but you know you had sex with a student right <laughs> also well, you know, she wasn't psychologically traumatized was she i mean i don't think yeah. so. no i, I think i it... think i think she was and i'll tell you why i think that played out in that really relationship she had with the guy she picked up who she encouraged to hit her oh, I yeah. think mm -hmm. I think she was definitely she was definitely exploring how to externalize the trauma that she was experiencing I do think she experienced trauma now whether that trauma whether she used that trauma to self-reflect and grow maybe not but I don't think that means that the trauma wasn't there. But that's what I, that was just what you were going to say is, was that the trauma from their relationship with Eric or from the stuff with her husband yes. and her childhood that was coming? Oh, and her childhood, growing up with her father. Absolutely. That traumatic, 100%, 100% traumatic. And I just wonder if it, if it had anything to do with the relationship or if the relationship brought out a, a lot of that trauma that she had. It's so, that's so hard. That's like picking, yeah. you know, if we had a big ball of yarn with all this, you cannot ever, and I tell everybody, you cannot pull one string and go, oh, this is it, <laughs> right? There's a lot, there's a lot that has like, you know, spun to get them to the, yeah. both of them to this spot. If I can add to that in very technical psychological terms, she was effed up long before Eric came around. Yes, she was. <laughs> right. She was. Right. And, and you yeah. know, she created this situation for herself because, I mean, I almost feel like that whole Eric thing was a punishment as well. It just was a, a, a more delicate, sort of intricate one because who was the one that told on her? Herself. Yeah. She told yeah. what happened. It wasn't that somebody externally came in and found out about her. She ran her own mouth to someone who would very obviously be the last person on earth she should be running her mouth right. to right. if she wanted to protect herself. Right, right. So I, I think she created this situation in the same way that she asked that other man to hit her. She was asking life to hit her, asking for the for the mm -hmm. pain that she was going to experience. But the fact that she out. did tell the, the, uh, the, her coworker, it does make you think that she really didn't appreciate the magnitude of what she was doing no. or she wouldn't have talked about it. And she was like, I think Jennifer, you said that she was like a little schoolgirl. Mm -hmm. well, because she's her already changed her reality at that point. It had been going on for a bit and her cognitive dissonance has been resolved. The discomfort is minimized. So she's got this reality in her head that this is like this love affair. And, you know, again, she's talking about it like she has some crush and, even though that alone was an affair and the woman called her out like you're having an affair and she's like hee hee and then when she finds out who it is and there's so much reflection like everyone that you see reflects to her like no even his friends i thought were interesting they felt badly for him a little bit they were not high-fiving their parents had gotten to them first to be fair but and i don't know what that would have been like if he had told them his their parents had told like, them at first i feel like they were and then when they realized like it wasn't just like a one and done and he was like cool about it and he was yeah. like messed up. They were mm -hmm. like, wait a second, this isn't right. But mm -hmm. Lindsay, what you were saying, I I do think that there's a level to that that maybe she kind of ratted herself out like subconsciously, like that she intended to do that because she wanted out of her current situation. She didn't want to be with her husband. She didn't want to be having fertility treatments mm -hmm. and having babies and doing so like, did she not realizing she was doing it unintentionally do it intentionally subconsciously whatever do make that comment to her friend to sort of get caught and see what happened maybe well, maybe she wanted this to be real i mean maybe she was tired of what was going on with eric you know on some level she wanted it to be real not just be this fantasy that they were playing out i just have to think that as as clearly an educated adult, she had to know that telling someone what she was doing, someone was not going to have the reaction she wanted them to have. I don't know. I think she convinced herself so much. Then she lowered her inhibitions by drinking. They sat there for a bit, yeah. you know, chugging that bottle. And I think that she thought they were friends and that maybe she would see it the same way that she did. Cause she seemed genuinely shocked, right? As an actress can, which she's great. Genuinely right. shocked that she took it that way. It wasn't even like, it wasn't even what a, I know what you're going to think. There wasn't even that, like, just hear me out. There was nothing like that. It was talking to her like this was some lovely little thing. And then she was like, 
And then she almost had a panic. I mean, they tried to show like what a panic attack might look like, right? Um, in that moment, because I think that she was just not expecting that. That kind of reaction comes from unexpected situations. Yeah. And so I don't think she was expecting you, it at all. Would you consider her a pedophile? No, but uh, technically a pedophile is before pu puberty. So okay. no, she's not a pedophile. Okay. No. So, but is what could you say about people in general like this who... Who, who do things like what she did um is she extremely immature like what's going on there psychologically was it fed by prior trauma i mean there's so many oh gosh it matters like what <laughs> route you take like like but you mentioned earlier and this was really good this was a time where she had control we always overcompensate for control when we have trauma always so if there was little to no control growing up she's going to be that's not surprising she's a teacher she commands the room she controls all of it like we can you can see people who have dealt with trauma growing up and it can range from anything from being extremely clean to being over controlling to making sure that their schedule is perfect. They cannot do unexpected. They go out of their way to make sure that everything is scheduled and you know exactly what to expect at all times. So I think that that was like a combination of it. But there's definitely if you just look at her at face value and how she is, there's definitely trauma that you can tell she's trying to compensate for that. And once she gets a hold of the complete control. You've never had that. When you don't have that, I mean, that's one of Maslow's hierarchies. You're all the way at the bottom of the primitive stage. Like, you need to feel your world is predictable. You need to feel in control of it and a comfort for that. So she would be hooked on that immediately. Even if it was accidentally found, she's not giving it up. Do you, do you guys think, though, like, was she, do you think she was a predator? Like, do you think she was looking for someone like that? Or this was just circumstance that happen like right right place right time wrong place wrong time however you look at it like i don't know if i feel like she was looking for this or looking I for yeah i i was wondering that too that's i'm wondering what linda and jennifer think about that i think she was looking for trouble but i don't necessarily mm -hmm. think she was looking for this brand of trouble it would have been fine in any format mm -hmm. <laughs> i think she was intrigued I think she was surprised in the beginning that she was a little bit jealous, especially at the dance. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think it became this like paradoxical thinking and that it was forbidden. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. And like, if anybody's tried not to eat the junk food, don't eat it, don't eat it, don't eat it. It becomes more desirable immediately. That's called like a paradoxical thinking thing. So I think that she tried to stay away. And the second she tried to not deal with those feelings, she immediately gave into them because that's what we do. Also, there's like an interesting evolution element to when somebody else and another female is in interested in a male, you know, back in caveman times, we were like trying to find the strongest mate and the one that was going to protect us. Right. So we all had the same goal. So if somebody else chose them. It was almost like they did the work for you. So you would automatically, that's why women, that's why males who have like girlfriends and wives suddenly become more desirable and unconsciously subconsciously sometimes but that is not surprising that that's what happened she was kind of okay with this let's just skirt the line and then that he was dancing on the dance floor with someone else and she almost did like the college high school like oh, you know a little like that's the thing she is i do think that she's because she didn't experience it but she became a caretaker young i think that she did not have that maturity and ability through the experiences so she behaved very much like a teenager but she's not a teenager and we don't kind of let that go she's not cognitively impaired you know we're not talking about anything like that so because that might be why we were kind of like oh it's like a teen because it felt like a teenage romance it, it felt like it a high did. school romance and then you had to stop back and be like, wait a second but she's his teacher she's not his classmate mm -hmm. yeah i do have a question though about the control aspect of it I mean, I, I see what you're saying about the control because of the power imbalance, but she also didn't have control in a lot of ways, like having to sneak around, always worrying that they were going to get caught, not knowing exactly when she was going to see him, when they were going to get together again. So how do you reconcile that part with... The control comes from him just being a lost puppy who would do anything that she said and anything that she did. And if she would call it, like she would, they would meet me here, meet me there. And then she would basically climb on and he would be there. Like that's, that's the control aspect of the rest of it just makes it forbidden, which actually an argument would make it even more desirable. I think the sneaking around too, you know, even though it's, it doesn't feel like control it is control because 
if you have some sort of you're harboring some resentment towards your partner and hey you're doing this thing that you know they wouldn't like and they don't know about it i think that that was there in her head too that that level of control yeah okay so we're gonna wrap things up unless you anybody else has any kind of pressing uh remarks because i i really loved this i thought it was Mm -hmm. i don't know what that says about me but i thought it was (laughs) Captivating, like I thought, just it thought was. That it was so well told, mm-hmm. and I felt like as you're watching it, you could totally understand things from her point of view, and then from his point of view. You know what? It kind of reminded me that that experience reminded me a little bit of. Have you seen a beautiful mind? A long time ago, it was actually filmed at the college when I went there. I watched them film. It was oh, fascinating. Wow. It was filmed at Fairleigh Dickinson when I was there. Well, now I have wow. to watch that again. <laughs> um, I thought, you know, when you watch a beautiful mind, you are in his world, right? He's mentally ill. He, I think he was schizophrenic. I mean, he was delusional, and but you're in his delusion and you're experiencing it along with him for for a pretty lengthy amount of time in the mm-hmm. movie, and then all of a sudden you're told through the storyline that none of this was real, that this didn't really happen. And as the viewer, you're like, but no, wait, no, that didn't Mm -hmm. happen. That Mm -hmm. wasn't real. And so you get to kind of experience like a tiny bit what it must be like for someone who's mentally ill to have to question like, okay, well, they're telling me that that didn't really happen, but it feels like it did. And I thought they kind of did something similar with this, where you're, you know, you're in it with them. So you're kind of seeing it from mm-hmm. their point of view. Um, so I thought, I think that's partly why it's so effective. It was very well done. It very was well done. very well yeah. done. So, all right. Well, thank you guys. Is there anything else that you watched recently that kind of moved you as much as this did? I'm always looking for something else to watch. No. I feel like it's always times like this. I have a laundry list and then you, someone asked me and you're on a spot. Yeah. I can't remember yeah. any of it. <laughs> well, you know what? When I, I have one. Oh, you do. I have one. Yes. So yeah. it's a horror film, but it's a weird horror film called speak. No evil. It's an Australian yeah. horror film. Really interesting viewpoint of people pleasing and how it can go horribly wrong. Ooh. Do you remember where you saw it? Which platform? It's on shutter. Oh. Which is on Prime or AMC Plus. Okay. All right. We might have yeah. our next right round table, kids. <laughs> I'll put my husband on that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank and you. Chuck, he, he was very good. He didn't even know how to Um, but thank you guys for watching. And we always have the replay on my podcast wake up call. So if you want to listen on wherever you listen to podcasts, you can do that. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>